developed a series of, of cars um, that just were trying to transform the idea of what surface language in a car and what design in a car could be. And yeah, I got pretty crazy towards the end. It was the, I think, Mazda Ferrari, is that how you say it? Yeah, the Ferrari. Such a great proportion. And, and if you guys don't remember it, the surfacing was, had not been done at that time. And today people um, do it um, not, not too often, but here and there. But it ha how would you describe the, the really detailed surfacing on some of the side body panels and what inspired that? Yeah, the Ferrari was, you know, it was an interesting program that we did at Mazda. It was really based on a, a LMP car. And the idea was that, you know, on every, any given weekend um, throughout America, 50% of any car raced was either a Mazda or powered by Mazda, which is an incredible statistic. So the grassroots... Um, kind of racing program in America it was really based fundamentally on a whole Mazda program. And Mazda had this kind of ladder program that you can get into for racing that stair stuff you up. Anyways, we, we thought that this is a great opportunity to really harness that kind of grassroots idea and build a street version of a race car that could be, you know, either way. So we went out, we, we thought we'd build a halo type, type product, um, based it off like an LMP chassis um, and it was a garage chassis it ended up being. And, you know, they're two-seater car. They're designed to be two-seater car, race cars. And we, we, we actually crammed two people in, into that. But the, the idea of, a, of the car was based on this design language that we called Nagare. And it was really, like, flowing with the wind. Yes. And, and so the whole language, surface language of that car was, was based around the, the wind and how the wind sculpts surface uh, aerodynamically and you know visually and a lot and there's a lot of pass-throughs which are really exciting when you walk around the car and you know from the 50s and 60s cars have been inspired by wind but it was the detailing that really i think made these cars extremely special and there was the race car version which i think everybody loved which we just talked about but then there was a more like clean and simple concept car version what was that one called and, and also the same. Oh, same yeah. thing. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Anyways. There was a, there was a series in that, um, uh, a, a, whole, a whole series of cars that we did th yeah. through that. Ferrari was the kind of culmination of it. Unfortunately, that car, um, you know, disappeared. At <laughs> which, which leads us to his transition. I do feel like a moderator now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <That's> okay. <laughs> to Tesla, because a lot of times when you're at a car company, you'll do the coolest stuff on earth. And then, you're, but you're sort of, designing for other designers sometimes because it doesn't always make it to the, the general public. Now, the servicing on that vehicle did. I did that did actually make it, I think, uh, matriculate it down. But I think the transition for you to Tesla was, a, a, was, was a, a sort of like a how do we actually change the world in a type of car we're doing. And I think that was probably one of the reasons why you decided to leave. Yeah, I think, you know, I was drawn to Tesla because of the sustainability message. And that was just something that was not coming, just no ability to do that um, at an OEM. You could, as a designer, you could do, you know, you know, work on material choices. But, you, like, holistically, brands weren't there yet. Nobody yeah. was doing it. But, you know, along comes Elon and Tesla and really trying to push this message. And it was an all-in thing. It was, you know, sink or swim. Yeah. And that really attracted me. And yeah, so I took the leap. And Very cool. I wanted to do that so you guys knew sort of the importance of his contribution to the world of design. Um, not only did he make a mark on it before going to Tesla, but of course, I think without question at Tesla, you're probably one of the longest serving C-level people <laughs> there are. I mean, probably what, since 08, so like, like 15 years yeah, or something. 15 years. Now. You have an intimate relationship with Elon. You've done some incredible things. So the Cybertruck is, you know, monumental in its design language. And, and you brought, you know, Tesla to a, another level of sophistication and refinement in, in the Model S days and, and to present day. So, well, I mean, it's, it's also a team, right? So of course, yes. Definitely not just me. But. With good leadership. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so that's, that's Franz. And 
he probably doesn't know that much about me, so I'm going to go ahead and talk, talk a little bit about myself. Um, the, the, my story started after they had already made a mark in the battery electric world. And I, the hydrogen scene, I had been involved, and I, you went to Art Center, I went yeah. to CCS, so, so you spent some time in Detroit, so did I. spent some time at CCS. Yeah, did you? Okay, very cool. I have a story there. Okay, all right, maybe that's for later. Um, but, but basically, uh, the whole picture of the, the electric world was shaping up, and not a whole lot was happening for hydrogen, and I really loved hydrogen for some of the things that it could do in terms of range, in terms of fast refill, in terms of lightweightness, that's why NASA uses it so much. I thought, there needs to be a car like the Tesla Roadster for hydrogen. And, and I just expected it to happen. I expected somebody, to, oh, this is obvious. Why wouldn't this just happen? And every year that it went by, it just didn't happen. And my career, uh, is, is my background is engineering, but also design uh, in Detroit. Then California, it was at Toyota, cal -T, and then Hot Wheels. So I did some wild stuff at Hot Wheels, which is a lot of fun. And then that migrated to sort of upper management, and then I got into sort of the M&A activity, and, and that was like, okay, this is a lot of fun. I miss cars, small cars. And design too, right? Yeah, exactly. I, exactly. I wanted to get back into it, but how can I make a mark? How could I really help the industry? And this is where I thought, okay, hydrogen industry needs something like this. Let's build the coolest hydrogen car that there is to tell the story of hydrogen. And that's why we built this XP1 vehicle. Um, and that was in 2011 that we decided to do that. And it took us, you know, a lot of learning to realize what are the challenges of hydrogen here, the benefits, how do you solve the problems and how do you build not just a car, but it has to be a package. It has to be the infrastructure too. So we ended up going into how do you generate hydrogen from water? And this reflected back into the design of the car, which we'll get into later. Um, but I just wanted to give a little background on myself. And the reason we're here is we both, of course, have background in design, upper management, but also zero emissions vehicles, yeah. right? Which, of course, is a little bit different than the things we're seeing today, but will be the future of this e event uh, in about 30 years. So, so people kind of are starting to become familiar with the EV space. Um, you know, I think the, the adoption rate is starting to turn, like it's becoming, I mean, we've seen all the different brands around the world like really get into EVs, but talk a little bit more about hydrogen. I don't think really people understand hydrogen. Okay. There's, yeah. there, there, there's some kind of barriers there that I think would be great to learn a it's little great. bit more about. I will, I will do that. Okay. So if you guys remember from chemistry class, hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table. And they don't just arbitrarily assign elements for fun. It's based on how much they weigh in their atomic uh, you know, creation and, and uh, I guess uh, the composition. So it's, it's very small, very lightweight. And because it's lightweight as a fuel, it's gravimetrically very energy dense. Now notice I said gravimetrically not volumetrically. So the reason for that is when you have hydrogen, you either need to compress it or you need to liquefy it. And it's been used predominantly for fuel cell activity um, and for rocket fuels at NASA, right? And there's a lot of NASA connectivity. We'll get into that also. But if I had to summarize for the general public what hydrogen really meant, what was the, the, the benefits of it, what are the challenges? The challenges are there's not a lot of infrastructure. There are infrastructures in California, about 60 stations here, but nowhere else. The benefits are you could refill a hydrogen vehicle in about five minutes, and it's also electric. The byproduct is water, and you can create hydrogen from water, H2O. So you can create hydrogen and oxygen to create, of course, the fuel. And if you're in a rocket application, you're going to use the oxygen and the hydrogen, but in our application for cars, it's just the hydrogen. So you have this fast refill, then you also have this range. And I'll talk about why the range is so important and, and how you get there. Effectively, a hydrogen car we built a car that goes over a thousand miles range. And you're like, oh my God, that's so cool. It is cool. It's actually not challenging to do in hydrogen. And the reason is the more hydrogen you add, you're not really adding a lot of weight. You're only, it's like 22 pounds of, of weight, right? The tanks are larger. And so you have to make sure that you package it properly. For a sports car, it's easy. For a sedan, it's, it's harder. And so you want to look at technologies that, to store hydrogen better. This is some of the things that we do with NASA. So you're looking at a long range, like 1,000 miles is okay to do, not, you know, that's special to us, but you look at about 750 miles range is something you could do in any hydrogen vehicle, which is important for trucks. Nowadays, when you look at hydrogen's um, dominance in the market, it's primarily for industrial uses. Most people don't know this, but hydrogen is already used in the market for industrial scale uh, purposes, creating ammonia for agriculture, refining other gases. And so it's already about a $400 billion industry for industrial gas. For automotive, it's tiny, very, very small. 
A lot of companies are doing it, but they are not ready to release these vehicles yet because there's no infrastructure. And so what we did was we said, let's build a car that talks about what hydrogen can do between range, fast refill, and durability. That's the other thing about hydrogen. It can last a really long time. You can actually make a fuel cell engine last 1 million miles in terms of its durability. And all these things, they're important, but not critical for passenger cars. So you don't need your passenger car to, to go 1,000 miles range. You need a passenger car to last you know, 15 years. You, don't need, you do want a passenger car to refill quickly. But you, what you need that thing, those things are are commercial vehicles. So trucking, long-range trucking is where you use the most of that. And the other thing about it is that lightweight benefit flying vehicles. So this is where anything with aerospace, hydrogen makes a ton, a ton of sense. And so we focus as a company on commercial vehicles. Of course, we built this really attractive, you know, sexy XP1 vehicle that, that goes, you know, zero to 60 in two seconds and all those good things. But practically, it makes the most sense for commercial vehicles. And it also makes sense for flying vehicles. This is where we focus on effect, effectively. Do you, do you see a future of, you know, just beyond the commercial adoption for just everybody, kind of the way that EV adoption is coming because it, yeah. it's, you know, what we found with, with EVs, it's, it's the infrastructure that's really important. It like really where do you, is. The, the biggest hang up that people have, is, the biggest question is like, where do you charge? How do I, exactly. how, how do I make sure I'm not going to get stranded or stuck somewhere? Exactly. Because, you know, they, there's not charging as prevalent, at least, I mean, it's, it's starting to change, but like there's not a charging station on every corner like a gas station. Exactly. So from a hydrogen perspective, how, how does, does that the, work? Does go? Yeah. Okay, so I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you, hydrogen starts in what's called return to base refueling. So fleet vehicles use it easily. As those infrastructures start to get built up for fleet vehicles like buses, like commercial trucking, class six, seven, and eight vehicles, you start to matriculate down to other types of vehicles. To your point, absolutely I see the need for a hydrogen truck uh, for like passenger perspective to be the next iteration of hydrogen. And separately, what is that gonna happen? We need to build out this infrastructure. And so the infrastructure is gonna take time. It's gonna take five years to even connect the two coasts, west coast and east coast here, because currently it's just on the west coast. So it'll take time for the infrastructure to come, and in the meantime, we'll see commercial vehicles. But let's say in seven to 10 years, you go to a dealership and you can say, look, I'm gonna have a choice. I can buy a battery electric vehicle, and these are the benefits, it's much simpler, but I have this range anxiety, I kind of have this challenge with, with charging, but I can also buy this hydrogen vehicle where I get this extra range and this fast refuel, and there'll be stations to support that. So over time, as there's more stations, it will come into play. The one thing that's very interesting is the cost of the stations themselves and how you get the power. So for battery electric vehicles, to build stations, you can do it quickly if there's power, but most often the grid wasn't built to put that much power because if you're charging many vehicles at a time, it's a lot of power. It's megawatts and megawatts of power, sometimes gigawatts of power for a lot of vehicles. And so what you want to do normally, if you were to look at the infrastructure, you'd have to wait a few years for the utility to build out to that location. You have to spend several millions of dollars to get that actual equipment, the harness that you're essentially building a substation. And to do that, it's very challenging. Whereas with hydrogen, what we did was we built a mobile refueler that has a lot of hydrogen aboard that can be placed many places and be refilled. And how it can be filled is two ways. It can generate its own hydrogen by splitting water using solar and also grid energy. And separately, it can have hydrogen carted to it. So I see that there's a benefit for both. If you go back into the history of, you know, even early electric, it was ACDC, you're going to want both in the future for different applications. Of course, the benefits of electric, battery electric being very simple, small vehicles, ready to go, home charging. How do we make hydrogen more available to people, more stations? And how do we make it so that they can buy a vehicle from companies like ours? Not just sports cars, but trucks that make a lot of sense. Because we, go ahead. One more question that we also had to overcome with it in the EV space is safety. Yes. You know, so you know, in the, in the early days, people thought, okay, batteries, they catch on fire, like they're going to burn up. Like how do you deal with the safety factor? It's compressed. It's like it doesn't yes. seem safe, but. I'm glad you asked. Because <laughs> actually this needs to be made aware for the general public. So batteries have their challenges. They're, they're not perfect. They want to be at a particular temperature that's you know, about 70 degrees, 72 degrees. And if it's a very cold climate, it wants to stay, it needs to bring the temperature up. If it's a very hot climate, it wants to bring the temperature down. And what you don't want is for any of those batteries to, to burst or have thermal runaway. So those are the challenges with batteries. You have to constantly make sure that they're hot or cold. And so in very extreme environments, batteries struggle sometimes to, to maintain that temperature 
because of the use. You can use, lose range because of it. So that's the, the challenge with, with batteries. What's the, the challenge with, with hydrogen? Remember when I said gravimetric energy density? Okay, so it's very lightweight, but volumetrically, how is that gonna affect the vehicle? Well, you have to compress it, very high pressure. And that's your point, is that safe? Well, to account for this, you guys see a lot of vehicles out here, and some of them are made of carbon fiber. They make them effectively out of carbon fiber, about an inch and a half thick, which is equivalent to about like 10 times that in steel. So imagine like a thickness wall like this. They make them so you can drop them from an extremely high building, you can catch them on fire in a bonfire for hours and hours, and you can essentially go into any speed, car accident, or like ballistic blast. So they're, they're made to survive anything, essentially, but they can be expensive. And so you've got to bring those costs down. So the challenge right now is not safety. In fact, they're extremely safe and they're not caustic. They're, they're actually cancer-free, so they're safer than gasoline, but they're expensive. So how do we bring those costs down? And right now, Toyota and a lot of other companies have found ways to bring those costs down like 70%. How do we bring them down 80%, 90%? Because once you do that, the beauty of hydrogen is you can really use less materials to get further yeah, adoption. So um, a battery pack has a lot of weights and that's a lot of a lot of different rare earth metals sometimes. And you can recycle those. It's a little bit challenging um, because there's so many different cells. But hydrogen is it's like an engine. It's very small, it's compact. And just like a catalytic converter, you melt it down and you take out the rare earth metals and you recycle it. It's pretty simple. And so as long as we can figure out the storage piece of it, now all of a sudden you have this benefit without the challenges. And what a lot of car enthusiasts today like about hydrogen is that you can actually use hydrogen also in internal combustion, which is not as efficient. Uh, efficiency in a fuel cell is like 68% efficiency, and you can get a little bit higher with some of the technology we're using. But ultimately, internal combustion is about 30%, or sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. And that's obviously due to heat, heat loss. However, if you've ever been to a Formula One race, I'm sure people here have, or if they, they start up these vehicles in a little bit, the sounds of a vehicle is extremely exciting. And there is a sort of a luxury to a silent vehicle from a Tesla that I think took the, 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 the world by storm. But people do sometimes miss that sound. And so there's a, there's a rawness to it and there's an emotional to it. You think of our five senses, you know, our, 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 our visual sense, our, our, our sounds and everything else. We want to tap into as many of those senses as possible with cars because they're really like almost anthropomorphic things, um, things that we can relate to as people. And so ultimately, the benefit of hydrogen sometimes is also that sound. So, but the challenge again is storage. So, you, you, you brought up ICE, the, the internal combustion engine. Yeah. Like, so we're here, we're looking at amazing 100 plus years of uh, internal combustion engines. You know, there's the transition from the carriage to the, the, the vehicle really happened actually through electric vehicles first. Yes. Until the uh, it was, again, it was an infrastructure problem, but um, internal combustion engines have been, we, we, we've grown up with generations and generations of those, but both of us are kind of sitting here putting out a new form of transportation, a new, uh, you know, we're, we're basically saying internal combustion engines no longer. Um, what, do you see a world where there is no more ma manufacturing of internal combustion engines and how soon do you think that's going to be here? So I think that's a question that everybody has. Yeah, so it's a really good question. And uh, I've had some conversations with some of the folks that you'll probably be seeing um, at the, the quail itself. And for this event specifically, if you think about a watch, I'm wearing like an iPhone watch right now. And, and I don't, but that's, that's not, that's a more mechanical system. As you, as technology develops, right? Um, this is probably a better watch than that in terms of what it can do. But that's a cooler watch. And there's but even cooler. What makes it cool? Okay, what's cool is, the, the craftsmanship and the detail and the history, and these things are special. And in the future, um, I believe that there will probably be a place, but a more specialized place, so very high-end cars. If you think about like a Bugatti, I believe they're gonna hold on to internal combustion because of that sound for a long time. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, Do you think it's really around the sound though? I think it's about the sound. Really? I think it's about the sound, I'll tell you, because um, they've wanted to do uh, racing for a long time for EV, and the crowds love that roar that comes through. And I, I, I only say this because I've heard this many times. Many like F1 teams will visit Hyperion because they want to learn about hydrogen, and um, NASCAR will visit and we'll, we'll, we'll give them like the lowdown. Here's the current state of the business, and, and this is how it's going to evolve. 
And their big thing is, hey, we want to do internal combustion. And we're like, that's like the least efficient thing you can do. Why would you want that? And they're like, our crowd loves that. It's a big part of what it is. So, so I'm speaking from that. And so I think that a big part of it's a sound. I also think um, collector car world, they see a history of evolution and how engines have appreciated in value over time. I think they're a tiny bit scared about batteries. They're like, what happens if something goes wrong with this battery? Will this value maintain? So I think that in the high, high echelon of collector car world, there's, they're going to hold on a little bit harder to internal combustion, but it won't be just internal combustion. It will be hybridized. There'll probably be some fuel cell piece in there because no matter how you slice it and what you say about everything, you can't, like a, a Model S Plaid will destroy a Ferrari. Like you can't deny it. You want your car to be the coolest car, but also the fastest car. So you're going to need to embrace electric vehicle technology no matter how you slice it. But I think that they're going to keep some of that emotion from the engine for a little bit longer. The rest of the world will, I think, um, be a little bit different um, and evolve to electric faster. And there's mandates to push that. But I think electric car world particularly is, is going to be different. How about I ask you a question now? Okay. All right. So using that as a segue, knowing that we're at a very special place at the Quail and we're going to see some very special cars. How do you see the future of the Quail as it relates to electric vehicles and those two worlds intersecting? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of what I was getting at. There, there, we're, we're at this, there, there, there's been a few transitions in history that have, that have happened. Obviously, the, you know, going from the, the carriage to the horseless carriage transition 120 years ago, let's call it. Um, now we, we're, we're, we're seeing this transition from ICE to EV and the mandates both at the, the OEM level and also at the government level pushing for you know, cleaner solutions. And we even see now the, the big oil companies getting into kind of a, a clean, sustainable uh, message and trying to you know, clean up their act a little bit, but really pushing for uh, a, a new generation. And I think you know, there, there's one more generation, that, one more future that's about to hit us. And, and we start to see it with this kind of chat GPT AI moment yeah. where suddenly this idea of autonomy and not having to drive anymore um, and being driven, chauffeured around as a convenience um, coming, coming at us, like we, it's, it's, it's right in front of our nose. And how is that going to shape transportation as we know it? And what does that do to the, you know, the, the, the sport car, the exciting car, the, 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 the desirable cars, right? Does, does that just mean they go away or is there always going to be a place for that? Um, and I kind, of, I kind of think of, you know, like horses didn't die off. They didn't go extinct, right? And, and people didn't stop owning horses, it just be, it, it transitioned to a different kind of use for the horse. It became yeah. more of a pleasure thing, um, or, or le less of as a means of transportation daily. And I, I, I see the the vehicles as we go through these new transformations, and like what you're doing, what we're doing, um, still being desirable and being you know really for the masses. But then that kind of top end uh, vehicle being you know maybe the regulations won't allow us to drive those vehicles on the road or any of these vehicles that we're looking at here um, or that we've been collecting over the years. And what do we do? Um, is there, you know, is there a new formula around that um, where it becomes more of a sport or an activity or a kind of a, a regulated space? You know, you see there's, there, there, there's plenty of um, tracks with homes on them where you can kind of join the club and the community and, and be a part of that. Um, and maybe it, that just expands. Um, it's, it's kind of a curious moment right now, and I don't know that anybody has the, 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 the crystal ball to see where this is going, but it's coming very quickly. And I yeah. think AI is going to rapidly transform our future in ways that we can't really comprehend yet and s solve problems way faster than the trajectory that we're used to solving them. Um, and I, I mean... I have a couple of collector cars. I wonder where that's going to go. Are they just going to sit and, you know, become a museum piece? Or are they going to be something that you can still use, like, on the weekend or occasionally, you know, occasionally use? I have, I have thoughts on this. You made such an awesome point comparing it to horse racing and horses. Um, I was just at the Kentucky Derby, and 
it is as popular as it's ever been. Probably sure. more popular. Yeah. Because, but also the, the people going, it's a different type of person, right? It's a different type of person that's going, looking for a specific thing. And so to your point on where do these exciting vehicles go, I think they're going to have homes in historic racing. I think they're going to have home in, in car shows. But also because hydrogen is a fuel and we have some insights here, there's going to be things called like net zero fuels, right? So you'll be able to use these vehicles because they were produced in green ways. So you could actually use, for example, um, water and solar and wind to create an actual liquid fuel that's carbon-based. And the idea is if you're creating it from green ways and it's still emitting carbon, it's sort of like not helping the environment, but it's in the middle. And I think that's going to be a baby step that we're, they're going to say, you can drive these older cars without a lot of conversions or anything, but you're going to have to use a, a, a net zero fuel based in hydrogen, making sure that it's made in a green way. The other thing that I think is going to happen is, because I'm seeing this now, legacy makers, if you look at what uh, Cummins is doing with their fleet of, of trucks uh, and other vehicles, is conversions to hydrogen. That like, hey, you can keep driving this for X amount more years, but you have to, because actually to convert to hydrogen is not that difficult. You just have to change the, the intake manifold, essentially, and have the right ratio. It's a stoichiometric ratio um, that avoids pre-ignition and is oxygen rich. And ultimately, you can do that by just adding to your cylinder head. Whether you want to do that to your Ferrari, I don't know, but an older MG, maybe that's okay, right? Um, and so there'll probably be a, uh, maybe another level there, but you're right, like after that, that's pretty much it. But you do know that there's so many popular outfits are retrofitting classic cars to electric also. And it's become extremely popular, a lot of them doing it in California, and they've got a list that goes beyond what they can even you know, produce. So I think there's gonna be a mix because the, the classic car styling is something that we all, I think, love and appreciate. And but, but yeah. so let's touch on that for a second. So, you know, so many of the cars that we see like out on the lawn or at Pebble, you know, were like coach built. A lot of times they're one off cars where the, you know, the original manufacturer so sold several cars, a coach builder comes and tweaks it, changes it, modifies it, maybe for an individual or something. Isn't that kind of what's happening now? I hope so. As with these transitions. And so where, where, where does that lead us, you know, into the future? I think, I think, I think it leads to cooler cars, right? I think I, I saw like a Super Allegra outside and, and these are famous like Italian coach builders that did some crazy cool stuff back in the day. And you're right. If you can give someone an electric chassis and the cool part about like battery electric specifically is the package is so simple. You can build almost anything on top of it. So there's probably a future where companies like Tesla can say, here's a blank chassis. It's been crash tested. You can technically drive it as it is and, and, and be safe. Um, but you can also sell it to an outfit that's doing cool things with it and it's doing really fun retro design or futuristic design. And they don't have to worry about the propulsion system. And so maybe that's the future we all can live in because that would be, I think, a fun one from a, from a designer's perspective and from a consumer perspective, because what we all can agree on, I, I hope, I think you agree on this, is that we don't like when cars all look the same. We want them to all look different because we're different and, and they're fun when they're all different and we can all appreciate them. And when you look outside on the lawn uh, today and on the block uh, in a few minutes, um, it's really, you'll see so many different styles. I don't know about you, but like sometimes you'll, you'll do a surface on a car and someone will say, well, you can't do that. That's not, you know, you have to have a, a slab sided body side here, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, did they do that back in 1960? I mean, it may be better for dynamics, but this is a pretty cool shape. And this is a reason unto itself to do something exciting. So I hope that it does happen the way we predicted. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, I, I keep thinking about where, where, like, if we think, if we project ourselves 30 years into, into the future, 40 years into the future, 50 years, like, what, what, are we still looking at the same lawn? Like, will, will the auction cars that we see out on the lawn today um, or at the different events this weekend be the same? And what's the mix of what, like, what you're doing, what we're doing? Um, will they be even present? Will they be collectible in a way? Um, you know, I think we, there, there's not a lot of mass market vehicles that are necessarily collectible. I think it's the really unique, special ones um, that, that really grab people's hearts because they're, they're rare, right? They're, they're one of a kind um, or, or a special colorway or, you know, a low vi uh, VIN. Um, and those are, those are the interesting things. And 
does is it, as we sit here and design for like mass transportation solutions, are we are we creating a collectible world? I don't know. It's a great question. So I'll, I want I want to say a piece, but I want to hear your answer too because I, I think you ha you'll have some valuable insights. I think that there's like, there's so many wonderful things that Tesla has done specifically that it's changed the industry. So it's going to be in a museum. It'll, it'll probably, those early bid numbers, signatures will probably be on the lawn in 30 years for sure. Um, and those early, early vehicles at the roaster. But also the Cybertruck, even though it's a, my, a mass market vehicle, is a, a, a total uh, departure from the expected and very special because of it. So I think for, from your perspective, you're going to see a lot of vehicles that you've done directly on the lawn here for different reasons. And that's the point that I wanted to make, and then I want to hear your answer. But the point that I want to make is when a car is special, you said special a few times, right? What is special? I think it can be defined by a few things. But the one I want to highlight right now is it was loved. And it could be loved by many things. Loved by the designer. Loved by the whole team that built it. Loved by the market. And for different reasons. Because when a car is loved special considerations are made. You, you have uncompromising um, decisions, effectively. Instead of saying, well, we've got to do this because it's, it's low cost. No, no, we've got to do this because we're trying to make a statement and we need to inspire people. And so I think that I'd like to, in, in 30, 40 years in the future, see all types of vehicles, uh, electric propulsion, uh, hydrogen combustion also, um, and even more advanced flying vehicles, right, here, under the condition that when you look outside, they're all special, and they also will be all special. Because at the end of the day, this is a pedestal of the greatest cars on Earth, and the future will also be like that. I, th I mean, I like the idea of them all being special, but I think there, there's so much innovation in a lot of these vehicles, too. And there's, like, you, you can probably walk around and see innovative moments on pretty much any vehicle that is desirable, right? Um, and I think that's... The, the, the innovation part is, I think, what ends up making the car special and maybe what like triggers you to like something versus maybe me liking something different yes um i'd be curious to hear what triggers you like what makes a car special to you or what do you have a favorite or is there something that i you do. aspire to or you already yeah. own or so i mean my so i know your history a little bit and so i want to hear about because your your father was in automotive design too right it was not. It was not a okay. designer, but not okay. A okay, got it. Yeah. The designer, okay. And I want to hear about this. Your history from the very early days. I think that can that can be very reflective. But for, for my history, I got into cars because my my dad was really into cars, right? And he wasn't like as a business involved in cars. He was in law, but cars was clearly his passion. And that passion transferred on to me. And and what what made me really start loving cars was once you get to that age where you're like, okay, like I want to be independent. I want to I want to find that, that mode of transportation that's going to sort of represent what I think is me, you start to realize, oh my God, like there's a whole language of cars out there and I don't know which one represents me, but I've got to find out, right? And um, it was, for me, um, one of the first cars that I fell in love with, it's just because of happenstance, was an MGB, like, which is not a bad looking car. It's pretty simple, right? Um, but uh, it was the fact that the, this MG had no engine and I, I wanted to rebuild it with my dad. And I got this very special time with my dad to rebuild that just a straight four cylinder engine together. And that ignited my love of cars. And once I got a little bit older and more familiar with, with vehicles, I really um, became obsessed with, okay, what, what do I, what's my contribution to the car world? And for me, I love design, but I also love engineering. And I, I don't love one more than the other. And when you go to like design school, there's some very talented people out there, like this guy. Um, what makes you special? What makes you stand out? And what made me special was that I understood engineering to a point where I could use different things to make the car special because of the engineering, right? And so I was very right brain, left brain. And growing up, the car I became obsessed with was the 1970, uh, well, technically 76 concept vehicle, the Lotus Esprit. It was the Lotus Esprit that I fell in love with, and it was because it was two titans of industry coming together to create something very special. It was Giorgetto Giugiaro creating this simple proportion where he was like, proportions everything. Detail is tertiary. And if you have a dramatic proportion and simple clean lines, you can get some amazing long-lasting shapes. And he was right. And Colin Chapman at Lotus was similar in his thinking, which was, 
hey, one part doing as many jobs as possible. And together, you have a very lightweight vehicle, which in its simplicity becomes special. So both vehicles were just honed in on simplicity. And ultimately, ultimately, what you have is something that I think the world had not seen. And to me, resonated with me as a right brain, left brain person. So from a from a introduction to cars perspective, it was a little old MGB with no engine that I got to rebuild with my dad. And from a what is car to me, it was a, a 1976, actually it was a 77 that I ended up uh, collecting myself, but it was that first generation Series 1 Lotus Esprit. And that was very special to me for those reasons of the engineering plus design equal parts, something special. That's interesting. It was definitely one of the inspiration vehicles that I was looking at when we were exploring how, how do we make this Cybertruck? What, well, what, what became the Cybertruck? Because um, that was a really interesting time where we were looking at a new market for where we could bring um, you know, electric propulsion. Pickup trucks were definitely, uh, th they're still the number one selling vehicle in America, uh, F-150 kind of range of pickups. And it's such an opportunity and we need to clean that up. And so we were looking at how do we how do we get into this market and do it in a way that's unique and different because we can. And, and you know, using first principles and a different perspective of looking at solving the problem from an engineering perspective. And so started looking at what, for the same reasons that you just brought, brought up the, the Esprit and then kind of delving into that a little bit more and looking at the simplicity of, of how do you create an exoskeleton type vehicle and you know, because ladder, ladder, a ladder frame, kind of body on frame type vehicle is pretty inefficient from an engineering perspective. And there's, there's some benefits, but the, 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 the cons outweigh the pros. And, um, and, and, and looking at this kind of exterior skeleton thing and, and creating the toughness on the outside and all these, all these things and looking at simplicity again is something that we do inherently at, at Tesla like our, all of our interiors are incredibly simple like the, the cars lacking any excess it's you know in, in designed to be efficient but the Cybertruck was different so you know we started looking at these materials and um, the, the material story really became the language of the vehicle and so I started looking back like the Lotus like what Gandini was doing, you know, creating this kind of wedge era. Because if you kind of simplify the silhouette of a pickup truck, it really is kind of a wedge in a way. If, if you had to draw just in like two lines to get from A to B, it's kind of two lines from the nose to the tail. And that's, I, I thought, that was its rawest, most basic form. And then it was just how do you make that into a vehicle that you can actually use and access and get in and out of. And, um, you know, I, I ended up looking a lot at, you know, stealth, stealth technology and F-117 was really amazing, but not attainable. It couldn't go out and like readily get one or, or, or collect one or anything. Um, but like, Gandini was a kind of at the same moment in the early, late 60s, early 70s, where there's this kind of similarity of vehicles. Through the 60s, there was this kind of body language, soft, round, really kind of simple, um, and I think he was looking to break that up a little bit, yeah. you know, look, look for a different way of bringing excitement and, and the uniqueness uh, through simplicity again. And I think the LP um, for, for Lambo was, was definitely a, so radically different as a car that was attainable. Um, and we were kind of at the same moment. We kind of did something that was so radically different to become attainable. Um, and so I have, a, I have a lot of strong parallels yeah. back to that moment. It's fascinating. Very fascinating. Um, it was interesting now owning, um, a, you know, one of those early Lambos is how actually not sheer and, um, you know, you think of the, 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 the early Countach as being just really plainer and sheer. That the amount of love that goes into the surfacing and language and, the, and the, just the finesse of, uh, of that car as brutal and raw and like, you know, plainer as it looks, it's absolutely not. Exactly. That, that's the craziest it thing. Detail, yeah. Yeah. It, it, same with the Esprit. I remember at first you're like, oh, it's just all flat planes. And then you, you look at it like, oh no, every single one of these planes has curvature to it. And that's why it's beautiful yeah. as well. And, and same people, when the, you know, it was a, uh, a complete departure when you guys built the, the Cybertruck. And people were like, oh my God, that's, that's too simple. 
But then you start to familiarize yourself with it, you look closer and you realize, wait a minute, like it looks planar, it's not. Like there's curvature, right? There's curvature. There, there's some curvature in the manufacturing process is stainless steel panels, right? Yeah. So, and, and the hardness being on the outside, I mean, it's, the, the panels can stop a bullet. Um, in order to form that, you can really only break form. So it's dead flat surfaces, is it break formed no only kidding. in one direction, which means if you want to create some curvature, the car becomes faceted, more like a diamond. And so when you see that, when you see that truck, it's actually very faceted, ha creates curvature through its planar surfaces, not too dissimilar to like a, a diamond. Interesting. It's, yeah, it's really unique. So, so if I'm looking at the body side of a Cybertruck, I'm, I'm looking at planar surfaces. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Dead flat. Wow, that's shocking. And yeah. even more impressive. Now, but the glass, I because you will have some strange reflections on flat glass. Is it have some curvature on the glass or? Yeah, through the manufacturing process of glass, it, it's really tough to make dead flat yeah. glass because it will sag basically okay. in the weight of itself yeah. over time. So there's just enough curvature, just enough curvature on the right. glass to stop the, itself from sagging. But and then, you know, getting glass to drop down into the doors, there's some curvature there. Yeah. So the glass definitely has curvature. I actually like the, the curvature on the glass. And I assumed that the body side had a tiny bit of curvature, but uh, that's, I kind of want to see one up close now. Yeah, soon, <laughs> soon. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to wrap up because they're going to begin this auction. So um, I did want to hear about how you got into cars, but maybe we'll save that for another time unless you... Okay, we'll see everyone. <laughs> I'm going to wrap up by by thanking Franz uh, for for his time as a very busy guy and and on saying I can't wait to see the new and exciting things that you guys are having in the future. And I also can't wait to show the world and yourself some of the fun things that we have planned for hydrogen because our first vehicle getting out there was exciting, but it's really about the other types of vehicles that you could build. So I'm I'm looking forward to to sharing that with you personally and also you know, professionally in the design world because it's, it's going to be a fun future. I, I also think, thank you for that. And thank you for the, the accolades. And, and likewise, and I, I look forward to, you know, fast forwarding 30 years from now, if we were sitting on this stage and kind of reflecting back and then looking at, at you know, what might be coming across the block here, what's out on the lawns. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the change in the market where technology is taking us, these moments in time, I think we'll look back and say, yeah, there was like a divisive moment where we didn't see Brett was right in front of our nose. And we look back on it and say, wow, what a dramatic change and how interesting we were being right in the middle of it and, and how fascinating that must have been, you know, like historically looking back. Um, and, and, and the effect and the impact that I think the, the really unique fun, lovable, innovative solutions now become the things that people covet and collect. You know, you, you mentioned your watch, you know, in 30 years, is the battery still going to work? Is it going to be something that you could just put on and, and use? Maybe, maybe not, but it'll still, there's, that was like a, a radical change in the way that we were using watches, right? And how much more they, in and, and your phone and everything. And I think cars are in that same moment. And I think we'll look back and say, wow, you know, there's that moment in time where this convergence of all these things happening really created a whole new era. I think people couldn't really, you know, when the transition of the, the, the carriage to the horse's carriage, they couldn't fathom what that new world was going to be. And now those are the things that we desire, you know? Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to look, sitting on the stage 30 years from now, you know, will, will what we're collecting still be what we're collecting? And what are the new elements that we're creating now be collecting? It's our job to make sure that they are. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a, that's a great way to wrap this up. It was, it was a pleasure. Yeah, uh, likewise. Thank you, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, uh, enjoy the auction, everyone. And um, we'll, we'll be around to talk to you. Like, thank you.